Hi, this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and be sure to check us out on Facebook and uh, look for our new newsletter coming out in September. And I'm here today with Carmine Vittoria, who's just published a book, Hidden in Plain Sight. So welcome, Carmine. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, I know this book is a very interesting book because it talks about the internment camps during World War II, which I don't think too many people actually know or in southern Italy. Yeah. You're right. Not many. That's the reason why I wrote the book in the first place. In fact, uh, I called my friend, uh, his name is Virgilio Provenzano. He lives, uh, he, he, well, he was born in Calabria. And he lived about oh, three, four miles from uh, in the town near Ferramonte di Tarsia. That's uh, uh, an internment camp, in fact, the only one in Calabria. The rest of them were internment town, but this one was an internment camp. I said, uh, Virgilio, you know, you lived about two, three miles from the place over there. You must have heard some rumors or something like that. Uh, about, you know, strangers coming in and out and so forth and so on. He said, no comment. I never heard anything. And that's the truth. Hmm. And I said, wait a minute. You put me on. Well, I'm cleaning up the language a little bit. You know, I use different words. <laughs> but, um, I said, okay, let me ask you another question. I said, well, you know, uh, you, you must be you must have been aware at that time, or your family may have been aware of it. But there's such a thing as Drangheta. And in Naples, you have the Camorra. In Sicily, you have the Mafia. But in the Basilicata, Calabria, and so on, that region, you have Drangheta. You must have heard about that. Is that common? I didn't hear that until 1975, 1980. I said, you put me on. And I use different words, but I'm just cleaning up the language. So I did my research, and I spent about a year or two. The man is right. He's absolutely right. And so I said, it's time I tell the story the way it really is. Now, the way I did this uh, book, instead of writing just an historical thing from one fact to another, leading to another, and so on like that, I don't want to do that. I want to, I, what I did, I picked up a sentimental story, a love story, and uh, show how history affected people's lives and families, intermixed history with uh, local people and so on. And that's what I did in this book. Okay. Yeah, and and um, you know, and that's and that's fascinating. So, you know, what is the historical background behind the story, and 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 how did it impact the people of Southern Italy? Well, uh, the story goes back to a famous book called "Christ Stopped at Eboli," uh, written by Carlo Levi. Uh, he was a Jewish doctor from the city of Turin. And he was a political dissident. He was a socialist, okay? And he opposed the fascist government. Well, what Mussolini did was, okay, uh, instead of putting these people in jails, he, he would uh, gather them and put them into towns in southern Italy, Basilicata, for example, in the case of Carlo Levi, he put him in this town in Basilicata called Aliano, which was about oh, 20 miles from Eboli. But the point is that uh, 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 Carlo Levi was transported from Turin to Eboli by railroad. But then from, from Eboli to Aliano, it was a little bit rough us, this, or that, and so forth. But the main point is this, that, that that modern civilization wasn't there in that little time. It was, the time was so remote that modern civilization never reached there. Hmm. So, for example, the local people would say, well, Christ stopped at Eboli. 
He never came here. <laughs> I.e., translation means we, we don't have modern civilization over here. And he adopted the the saying in that town, Christ stopped at Eboli. Very famous book. They made a movie and so on. So this was a way by Mussolini to hide political dissidents from the world uh, scene or visual. And not only hide the, these political dissidents from the world, but from Italy itself. Mm. Okay? Because they were in a remote town, they could go about it. They had to check in every day, signing in to the registered city hall, like that. So hence the title, Hidden Plain Sight. People could walk about, but you know, and they were political dead. I ever. Mussolini learned a lesson. This is a good way to hide political dissidents and so on in World War II. Now, uh, and I asked myself, why in the hell does he want to do that? I mean, okay, political dissidents, I understand. But why gypsies? Why Jewish people? Why this? Why that? I don't get it. But the point was this. He wanted to convey a message to Hitler and say, see, me too, I got internment camps too, just like you. That's son of a so-and-so, I'm not <laughs> going to say that. And so he was piggybacking with the hope of getting the crumbs, let the men do the war, not take the crumbs. I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, that was yeah. his philosophy. Now, is so, it true? Because I had heard, and I, I, don't, I don't know if it's true or not, I I heard a long, long time ago, even before I started doing this stuff, um, that Mussolini he didn't he didn't deport the Jews out of Italy. Is that true? That's true. He did not deport. Here's what happened: as the Allied army advanced north from Sicily, okay, so it was a stalemate in the south of Italy. Now you got to remember this. Mussolini was put to jail by the King of Italy on July 25th, 1943. And from July 25th, 1943 to September, I believe, 12, Mussolini was in jail, put in jail, okay, moved around and all that. But nobody was in charge. Mm. And the northern internment camps or town, not camps, but town, remember this, that was different. That was under German control. They controlled northern Italy. But in southern Italy, it was controlled by the, the, the not by no, nobody, at least the American army and the Allied and so on. They took part of that, that country. But now here you have a situation where the man that invented these internment towns in southern Italy, he was in jail. So the guard asked himself, wait a minute. The boss is away. What are we going to do? They took off. I mean, let's face it. People were starving, and including the guard. Nobody paid them. I mean, the the, the king of Italy and uh, I forget the other guy like that. They were in uh, in Puglia. I forget the name of the town, and they they didn't uh, print the money. They didn't have any control over the situation. Nothing. So the guard, said, I have got paid. My family is starving. So they left internment towns. So the internment, the internees, they were on their own. What mm -hmm. are they going to do now? I mean, go north where they came from? No, but the war is still on. <laughs> and then north, they're going to not gonna go there. So some stayed put. That was the safest spot to be. None got killed. And besides, the guards were in the same position as they were. So that's what happened. I described that in my book. Yeah, that's that's something. You know, I, I have to ask my cousins mm -hmm. because my cousins lived in Puglia through the war. But when my grandparents came, they left my oldest uncle there. So all my cousins were born in Italy from my uncle Giovanni. And, uh, you know, my cousin recounted um, seeing, you know, the, the port of Bari being bombed and running into the fields um, to, to, to avoid getting, you know, bombed. Although their town never got bombed, but they could see it in the distance. And um, like you said, they, you know, food was scarce. I asked her, what did you eat? And she said, beans. That's yeah. what they ate. They eat beans. That's what she said. She said, and then when the Americans came, 
she said she was, I think, 12 or 13. They would go into Bari and, uh, and uh, sell things on the black market. Yes. And now, uh, that, that big Ferramonti, by the way, the only, you know, whenever you picture, when you, whenever you talk about internment camps, you have this picture with the fence and the dogs and all that. That was not a way at all. Not at all. Not at all. In fact, the only one in southern Italy was, as I said, the Ferramonte di Tarsia. There was no fence, no nothing like that. Just buildings like that. And there were something like 3,500 to 4,000 people, but families, units. Mm. They had their own rules like that. They had their own political system, their own government. In fact, there were 25 marriages over there. And and there were five, six children born there. I, I can't remember go by memory. And over there, and so it was almost like normal thing. And and the guards, they were not, there was nobody that died at the hands of the guard, nothing like that. The only death that happened was there was a stray bombardment from a plane, an Allied plane, and they, they, you know, they, they, they dropped a bomb and somebody died from it. That was it. And the other thing was malaria. You got to understand that part of Italy, there was a lot of malaria around there, and some got sick, and a few of them got killed. You know, they see, you know, died from malaria. So the Germans at that time. So so when the Germans were in control of the South. They just were hands off. They didn't. They didn't care. No, because let's face it: the, the, the Germans were in Sicily. They were chased out of there, right? Now, while Montgomery and Penn were arguing among each other, the Germans and the Italians took off. Okay, After they they actually rented a ferry boat. <laughs> Boom, <laughs> and, and they went across the Strait of Messina. Now. Think about this. Here you have Italian troops and German troops leaving over there. But you see, the Germans needed work, people work in their factories, okay? So what do they do? They load up Italian soldiers onto trucks. Yeah, I and understand. My uncle, my uncle was one of them, was put on the truck, okay? So, and they're going along, they, they, they ask themselves, well, what am I doing in the truck? Am I a prisoner or what? And my, my uncle always told me that. He said, then what happened was, it was in the July, it was hot as hell. And so, and the truck stopped on one of these beautiful beaches in, along Calabria, okay? And they, they took all their clothes off, these German soldiers, and they went, they ran to the beach. So these Italian soldiers, about 20 or 25 of them, they look at each other, what the hell are we doing here? Let's get out of here. And so now some went north, like my uncle did. Uh, he walked 120 miles from there all the way to my town in Melbourne. Others went uh, east, and a lot of them worked in farms in Basilicata around there, and some went south. That was a smart thing because they were going north, so he got, they went south. Mm -hmm. But my uncle did the wrong thing, going north, because that's where the Germans were going. Okay, now, um, history books claim that when the Germans occupied Rome, September 10, that they took Italian soldiers as prisoners. That is not true, according to Carmine Vittoria, because he took prisoners right after they crossed the Strait of Messina, August 17. Okay? There's a difference. Small yeah. difference, but it is a difference. They took prisoners right there and then. They loaded them in trucks and all that. Now, when the Germans got to Naples, you know, the Neapolitans, you have to understand who they are. They, they have uh, this philosophy of credo. They call it Chiaranjano. That means we are there to survive. They're rather bullshit. They rather talk nonsense, you know, because <laughs> life is too short. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, so, and they tried to dialogue with the with the Germans, say this or that, you know, like that. But the Germans took it as a the occupied, they took it as a weakness, you know, on, on their part. They misunderstood the the character of the of the locals. But in the meantime, 
what the Germans were doing, they're loading up young men, you know, 18 and older, on the trucks and shipping north on their factories, okay? When the Nippons are realizing these guys are not bullshitting around, they're, they're serious. They're taking our young men. I said, without our young men, we're done. We have nothing to look forward to. So they revolted. The Skunitsi, these the local children. And they, they, they fought the Germans. They chased their out. They had 20 tanks. 15 of them were destroyed during the revolt. And they left town in a hurry. Wow, so, that's great. Yeah, I never heard that story. So when Clark came into, when Montgomery went to, came to, to Naples, the town was liberated. And so, and he was introduced, Phil Marshall Montgomery was introduced, the girl that led the revolt, one of the girls that many of them, young woman, and he planted two kisses in her cheek. That was nice, gratitude, beautiful, you know, thank you, like that. But Montgomery, I mean, Mark Clark comes into town, he comes like an emperor, you know, like a, I have a conquered neighbor. What the hell you do? You didn't do shit. Sorry, my English. So, so anyway, the only thing he's worried about where where's the next lunch? So, he went to this restaurant called Mama Teresa, which was very expensive at that time. But they didn't Mama Teresa's restaurant didn't have any food. So, what are we going to feed them? Here's a general, a three-star general, lieutenant general. So, guess what happened? The cook, the chef. He went to the, the aquarium, you know, where the fish are kept. And he grabbed one of these bass over there and, <laughs> and the filet and all that. And he fed the general. And general said, yeah, that's the most beautiful meal I ever had. Um, but anyway, that's a story. Um, so, so, so in this, in this story, Mussolini moved everybody south to get them out of the way. Um, did they all then migrate back after the war? That that would did a lot of them stay in these towns, or did they all come home? Journeys, the yeah, journey? yeah. Well, here's what happened. Obviously, they, they, they were not about to go north. For example, some came from Austria. Some came through the, the Brenner Pass. They went like that. Other came from Trieste across over there. Uh, other came from Nice, France, you know, mm. over there on that side. So they came down. So for them to go north, it'd be silly. First of all, the Germans occupied the rest of Italy in the north over there. And also there was war. And there's still a big uh, warfare in Russia and Germany and France all over like that. They're not about that. Some of what they did, they went through... Uh, um, through Puglia, I forget Brindisi, yeah, Brindisi, mm. because that was the the port closest to to the other on the other side, and they went to Israel. Now nowadays, uh, those oh, days, yeah, like, and some immigrated to Portugal, went to America or England, whatever like that. So some found they were there was no restriction for them to go any place they want, okay, but some stayed put. They, 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 they stayed put, and then as soon as the war was over, they headed north. They went north. For example, one family I described in the uh, in my book, they went back to Vienna. But you see, whatever the bombardment didn't destroy, the Russians destroyed with their tanks and, and all like that, their neighborhood was totally wiped out. So lucky for them, there was a... Um, what they call a white bus uh, group from Sweden or the Scandinavian. They were looking for people like that. And they deported them, not deported, but they took them to Denmark, Sweden, places like that, the Scandinavian. And and uh, and that's what happened to some of them, not all of them. Some, of course, went to their homes, they found and so forth and so on, like that. So they dispersed all over, okay? Not many of them, but they, however, though, is I ever. All the internment towns in the north from 19, September 8, 
uh, tree on arm like that. All of those uh, people there, uh, Jewish people, they were deported to Auschwitz, other places like that, for you know, like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I interviewed I interviewed somebody. Uh, boy, it's probably over a year now. Uh, yeah. And he's he's from the north, Jewish. And he told me he didn't know he was Jewish until he was 30 years old. Yeah, yeah. And he's well, a young man. I mean, he's only like 36 or 37 now. Now, I'll give you an example. Of what you're talking about is that in the town of Potenza, which is in Basilicata, okay? Now, you had a bunch of, of visitors, mostly Jewish, and there was an Italian woman. They went to this town, and, and they met the mayor. You know, the mayor... You know, all plumped up and everything. And they said, well, there was an internment town here. Your town was an internment town. And that's not true. I I employed the uh, uh, 40 historians and they said that uh, uh, that uh, there's no internment towns here. That is not true. So one of the Jewish guy, the old guy, he said, well, excuse me. There's a birth certificate of my daughter <laughs> over here, issued by your city hall at that time. And then another one said, here's a death certificate over here. And if you go to this cemetery, you'll find that my uncle, this or that, uh, died, you know, was buried over there. And then, of course, the, 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 the mayor turned different shades of white, right? And he was embarrassed. I mean, uh, so... And the, the, the problem is this, a lot of the, you see, think about this, from July 25 to September 8, 1943, there was a lot of confusion. Why? Because the, the, the architect of the internment town was in jail, right? And the minister that uh, carried this out was also uh, in jail, okay? Now, and whatever, there was a vacuum. So now people that were in charge, for example, fascist mayors during that time, they took off. <laughs> they took off. You follow me? Mm -hmm. they said, well, this is too dangerous here. I'm out of here. And so and first thing he did, or, or she did, was take all her register. People signed in and all that. Destroy them. Mm -hmm. Okay? In other words... And we'll go to a town where they don't know him and then come back to the same town and say, look, I didn't do anything. There's no record. Huh? Yeah. You see that? Yeah. And so uh, the problem is a lot of the towns that had that registry, people don't know it should be an internment camp because there's no record unless you have a birth certificate or death certificate or something like that. And uh, so anyway, I'm sorry to bore you. No, no, not at all. No, this is fascinating. I mean, I love history, so this is this is really great stuff. Oh, anyway, and and yeah. also, I mean, and 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 the and the Pope was kind of ambivalent to all of this, right? He and, uh, just don't give me hands started. off. No, I have to ask yeah. because it's out there, you know. <laughs> well, you ask, and you're going to get it. <laughs> no, no, that's why I asked. <laughs> okay, now. There was a pope before Pope the, the Twelve, uh, Pope Eleven. He was um, he, he was going to issue what they call encyclical. You know mm -hmm. what encyclical? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the the church uh, philosophy or whatever like that. And and he employed a uh, a monk to write. Uh, the position of the church relative to the Jewish situation. Okay? He has some beautiful saying, unbelievable saying. And so, and he was going to announce it to the whole world. And I forget the date. I think it was uh, 19, uh, in February, 1941 uh, or 42, I forget. The day that the oh 39 at 40 anyway around that time and so he was supposed to give it a february 11. now on february 10 he died hmm. okay uh let's leave it at that okay let's yeah leave it. yeah 
All right? Uh, you can formulate your own opinion, and I can formulate my own. I don't have to express my opinion, okay? So only about three weeks later is a, a new pope put in, okay? Pope Pi, Pius the Twelve, okay? And um, there are many things said about him. And um, I think Robert Cotts, uh, who was a famous writer about that period of time, who lived in, uh, he, he was from the Bronx, New York, but he, he lived in that adult life in Florence, Italy. And he write books about that period of time. And uh, and he wrote about Pope Pius XII as the, the Pope of Silence. Mm. And uh, it's uh, probably the best description of him. So I'll leave it at that. Is that okay? No, no, that's fine. I mean, I've I've read and watched things about his his. Uh, yeah, but uh, his... anyway, let me tell you what I did in my sentimental love story. In one internment town called Tito, I, I picked that Tito because uh, for a number of reasons. But main thing was. I want to introduce the local people, interaction among them and all that. And one of them was a barber, and his name was Ottavio. But he was also known in town as Bambolone. And so I created that character. And you may ask me why the character, because I got tired of always referring to barbers as Figaro, you know. Because, uh, you know, like that, I said, how about Bambalone? I like Bambalone. So, Bambalone in Italian means um, a boy doll, okay? And where did I get that from? Well, if you saw the movie Norbert the Greek, uh, where Anthony Quinn, you know, dates this uh, woman, the old elder woman called Bambolina. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> Why not Bambalone? You know? <laughs> And so, and then I show, you know, his real name, not even Octavio, like, like in that area over there, people invent names only because it's got respect or something like to that effect, okay? But he was a goofball, that's basically what it is. But also kind-hearted, beautiful heart, okay? And so then I have the story that, that the two, German, two Ukrainian soldiers escaped from the German convoy going north like that and going toward Tito. And guess what? The the Bambolona sees them, so they, they were by the, the water fountain because they were thirsty in July and all that. And so then he couldn't speak German like that. And then the Ukrainian could speak German. So they could, the point was, to make the whole story short, was the Germans are on the way here. So we got to do something about this. And then his, his, um, his mother-in-law was a champion, and she was a matriarch, and, she, and he warned her about that. But in the meantime, the people around him, they looked at Bambolon because the mayor left town because, you know, he was a fascist. So here was a no mayor, nobody, no authority. So he took charge, just like in the, in the movie, the, the, the Secret of the Victorian, again, Anthony Quinn. Okay, and I, I copied that, but that was a beautiful, beautiful way of putting it. Anyway, I love that. Anyway, sorry. I no, no, that, no, no, it's, it's, you know, that's the whole, that's the whole point. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, you know, fascinating stuff. And, and like I said, people, you know, people don't understand what happened. That's why I like to do these things. Um, so before we go, where can people find the book and where people, where can they find you? Okay. The, the book is um, available on Amazon.Kindle.com. Uh, in the old days, when I wrote the other two books, I printed myself, I shipped to myself, and all that. But this time, I got smarter. A uh, publisher put the ebook, paperback, and the uh, hardcover on Amazon.Kindle.com. And this way they can, they can get the books in a couple of days or three days rather than wait a week or two weeks like that. By the way, uh, the e-book cost $8, paperback $25, and uh, hardcover $30. Well, Carmine, thanks again. I appreciate it. 
and um, looking forward to, I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to getting it and reading it. Oh, thank you very much.